It began about 1.30 the afternoon of November 21st, the President's trip to Texas. 5,000 persons were at the San Antonio International Airport. Teletypes began relaying the story from the edge of the parking ramp even before the presidential jets sat down. Then it was there, and the crowd surged in anticipation. San Antonians had last seen the president during the 1960 campaign. His two visits to Texas since his election had been to Houston and El Paso. Accompanied by Mrs. Kennedy, her first trip to Texas, the president smiled broadly as he left the plane. His mission was to dedicate the School of Aerospace Medicine at Brooks Air Force Base. 125,000 persons lined the route of the presidential motorcade waiting to see the chief executive and Mrs. Kennedy. In less than 24 hours, Kennedy would be dead, Governor Connolly wounded. Next stop on the scheduled three-day tour was Houston. Flags and other souvenirs were sold to crowds at the airport. Signs welcoming the president and the first lady were hoisted. The trip was said to be non-political. Political strategists knew it was anything but that. The Fort Worth Star-Telegram's Washington correspondent, Robert Hilburn, wrote that the trip might decide how Texas would vote in 1964, that the president had to see for himself if he really was in as bad shape in Texas as he'd been told. Vice President Lyndon Johnson, a Texan who would be president the next day, was to host the Kennedys at his ranch near Johnson City Friday night. In Houston, the president attended a testimonial dinner for Congressman Albert Thomas, U.S. Representative for 27 years. Mr. Kennedy's speech looked to the future. More water, more schools, more housing. A future in which this, the youngest American ever elected president, appeared destined to play an historic role. Late that night at Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, souvenir signs were being sold for 75 cents. The base was thrown open to the public, and some 6,000 gathered on the flight line to welcome the fourth president to visit Fort Worth in the city's 114-year history. Kennedy in 1964, Goldwater in 1864 read some of the signs. Air Force No. 1, the presidential jet, touched down at 11.07 p.m., arriving from Houston 22 minutes behind schedule. There were cheers in the night, and Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce President Raymond Buck shouted over the noise, Welcome to Fort Worth, Mr. President. The president replied, I'm happy to be here, happy to see all of these people. The vice president was still a sidebar to the story. There was little film taken of him and of Governor Connolly as the cameramen and the crowds concentrated on the president and Mrs. C Kennedy. Fort Worth's skyline was lighted especially for the occasion. The welcome sign was out at Hotel Texas where the chief executive spent the night. An estimated 4,000 persons were clustered outside the hotel entrance. The president and the first lady left their convertible. Plans called for them to enter the hotel immediately, but the president and Mrs. Kennedy walked across the street to shake hands with those they could reach. A reporter asked, what do you think of the Texas crowds, Mr. President? They're wonderful, wonderful, Mr. Kennedy replied. From the crowd, voices shouted, God bless you, Mr. President. We love you, Mr. President. Welcome, Mr. President, read the Star-Telegram headline. Kennedy and the First Lady entered the hotel and retired for the night in Suite 850. Before dawn, the morning of November 22nd, people began to gather on the parking lot across the street from the hotel where the President was scheduled to make an appearance. 
Light rain was falling from a gray sky, and nearly everyone wore raincoats, including police officers stationed atop nearby buildings. Shortly before nine, the crowd had swelled to more than 8,000. Some of them had been standing in the rain three hours. Bareheaded and without a raincoat, the vigorous young chief executive left the hotel and headed for the crowds he loved so well. More than 2,000 persons were waiting for the president's appearance at a chamber of commerce breakfast in the hotel's grand ballroom. He was given a prolonged ovation, but it failed to match the response to Mrs. Kennedy's entrance. She was wearing a bright pink suit with a blue collar. In less than four hours, the suit was stained with her husband's blood. The president captivated the crowd with his easy charm and good humor. Years ago, I said that, uh, introduced myself in Paris by saying that I was the man who had accompanied uh, Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. I'm getting that somewhat that same sensation uh, as I travel around uh, Texas. <laughs> Nobody wonders what Lyndon and I wear. With <laughs> I'm glad to be here in uh, Jim Wright City, about uh, 35 uh, About uh, 35 years ago, a congressman from California, just been elected, received a letter from an IRA constituent that said uh, during your campaign you promised to have the Sierra Madre Mountains reforested. You've been in office for one month and you haven't done so. <laughs> well, no one in Fort Worth has been uh, that unreasonable, but in some ways he has had the Sierra Madre Mountains reforested. And uh, here in Fort Worth, he's contributed to its growth. He speaks for Fort Worth and speaks for the country. And I don't know any city that's better represented in the Congress of the United States than Fort Worth. And if there are any Democrats here this morning, I'm sure you won't hold that against them. <laughs> I couldn't let you leave Fort Worth without providing you with some protection against the rain. White House on Monday. If you'll come up there, you'll have a chance to see it then. Downtown Fort Worth was alive with cheering crowds when the presidential motorcade left the hotel for Carswell Air Force Base and the 30-mile trip by jet to Dallas. The president and Mrs. Kennedy rode in the convertible with Governor and Mrs. Connolly. By this time, the sun was out, and all along their route, there were cheering crowds, including hundreds of students who were dismissed from classes so they might see the president. 
Although they were behind schedule, the president and Mrs. Kennedy once more went into the crowd to shake hands with scores of well-wishers. Handshakes that will be treasured by the lucky ones in the jubilant, cheering crowd. Only the day before, handbills derogatory to President Kennedy had been found scattered around Dallas. Police collected a dozen or so, but were unable to learn who distributed them. Assistant Chief of Police Charles Batchelor urged citizens to report any suspicious activity along the parade route on Friday, but when he was asked if trouble was expected, he replied, We would not think so. Uh, there are probably groups here that are opposed to his coming and uh, take this method of expressing themselves, but uh, I don't think that uh, the posters within themselves indicate any uh, attempt to, uh, to harm the president. When the silver jet made its last turn in landing at Love Field in Dallas, there was the promise of an excellent day ahead. The crowd was happy. The rain that had fallen earlier was gone, and the Texas sun seemed to add a little bounce to the Kennedy gate. The president was headed for a civic luncheon at the Dallas Trademark, but there was time for him to say hello to his admirers, and with both hands pumping, he met as many of them as he could. Then all aboard for the start of a 15-mile motorcade to the trademark. President and Mrs. Kennedy and Governor and Mrs. Connolly occupied the special presidential car that was flown to Texas from Washington just for the occasion. Although it is not bulletproof, even with the bubble top canopy, it was designed for President Eisenhower and has bulletproof glass windows and other features. Reportedly due, at least in part, to the obvious friendliness of the crowds, Mr. Kennedy elected to ride in the open car. There was no estimate of the number of people who gazed on the presidential party as it passed, but it was big, probably the largest in Dallas history. The city is noted as a stronghold of conservatism. It's the home of former General Edwin Walker. It's where Adlai Stevenson and Vice President Johnson had been subjected to abuse. But on this day, evil thoughts seemed elsewhere until the motorcade turned past the Texas School Book Depository building at Elm and Houston. It's not known for sure, but it is believed that President Kennedy has been shot. President Kennedy was in a motorcade en route to the trademark where he was to address a luncheon gathering shortly after noon today. As I say, it has not been fully confirmed, but police radios are carrying that the president has been hit. The president's party, his wife, the governor, senators, and all other political officials were en route as fast as they could get there to Parkland Hospital under heavy police siren guard going extremely fast past the trademark, past the large throngs of people awaiting to catch a glimpse of the president. It's thought that the incident occurred near the underpass section entering the Stemmons Expressway just on the outskirts of downtown Dallas. This unit is presently en route to Parkland Hospital. Confirmation will come shortly. From Dallas, Bob Welch, WBAP Radio News. The president, in fact, was mortally wounded by a bullet which smashed into the back of his head. He was unconscious when he reached Parkland Hospital and never recovered. Governor Connolly, who also was the assassin's target, was more fortunate. A bullet crushed one rib and damaged a lung. It emerged from the chest and hit the governor twice more in the wrist and leg. He suffered a serious loss of blood, but survived. A stunned crowd at the trademark, eagerly awaiting the arrival of the president only a few minutes earlier, heard the announcement that the president was dead. They prayed.
At Parkland Hospital, Dr. Malcolm Perry, assistant professor of surgery at Southwestern Medical School, was on duty when the mortally wounded president was brought to the emergency room. I was having lunch in the main cafeteria in the hospital when an emergency page arrived for Dr. Tom Charge, chief of surgery. Knowing that he was presenting a paper out of town, we picked up the page, Dr. Ronald Jones, surgery resident, myself. They informed us that the president had been shot and was being brought to the emergency room. We went there immediately and he had just been brought in. It was obvious initially that he had a severe lethal wound. And arriving at the emergency room, uh, Dr. Carrico had placed a tube in the president's trachea to assist his breathing, but there was a neck wound anteriorly and a large wound of his head in the right posterior area. I could not detect a heartbeat or pulse, but he was obviously Marbon and having considerable difficulty with his breathing. At this point, I elected to do a tracheostomy to assist his breathing, requested assistance from Dr. Kemp Clark, Chief of Neurosurgery, Dr. Charles Baxter and Robert McClellan, attending surgeons, who came to my assistance immediately. Blood transfusions were began. With the assistance of Drs. Baxter and McClellan, I completed the tracheostomy and respiration was assisted. At the time of the tracheostomy, I noted evidence of air in blood in the upper mediastinum. I felt that an injury had been sustained in this area by the passage of the bullet through the neck and asked that a chest tube be put in place, which was done. Dr. Pepper Jenkins, chief of anesthesia, by this time was assisting his respiration. Dr. Selden and Bashir from the Department of Medicine were in attendance also. We noted that Again, there was no detectable heartbeat or pulse. I instituted cardiac massage, externally applied, and Dr. Kemp Clark and I continued this massage for a time that is unknown to me. I was quite busy at this particular instant. I don't know the exact time sequence. An electrocardiograph was uh, attached to Mr. Kennedy to monitor his heartbeat but no detectable activity was present, and it was realized that the present had expired. The priest who administered last rites to the president, the Reverend Oscar Huber of Holy Trinity Catholic Church, gave a graphic description of the scene in the hospital's emergency room as the nation lost its president. Upon arriving at the hospital, the policeman took me to the emergency room immediately. And there the president was lying on the portable table. He was completely covered with a sheet. His wife was standing beside him. And I immediately proceeded to administer the last rites to the president. I removed the sheet so that I could anoint his head, giving him the sacrament of extreme unction. Uh, previous to this, I had given him conditional absolution. This was followed with the apostolic blessing. The sacraments were given conditionally because we did not know whether he was living or dead. The doctor did not inform you then when you walked in as to his condition? No, they did not. There were doctors there and uh, secret service men, I presume, and policemen but no one said anything to me whether he was living or dead. Did you speak to Mrs. Kennedy at any time? I did after that. I expressed my sympathy and the sympathy of my parishioners to her. I told her we was terribly shocked at hearing this sad news. And she thanked me very graciously for coming down and taking care of the president, of his spiritual needs, and uh, asked me to pray for him, I assured her that I would. Did she show any outward signs of uh, emotion, or was she composed? She was very much composed. She was seemingly paralyzed, or in a shock. She spoke at times, uh, softly, rather softly, but without any emotion. She was not crying. I could not understand how she could hold up under these circumstances. A little more than two hours after the Kennedys left their plane at Love Field in an open car, they returned in a funeral coach. 
The bronze casket was loaded aboard the plane, and Judge Sarah T. Hughes was called to administer the oath to the new president. There were about 25 people in the plane. There were some congressmen, uh, Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Kennedy, uh, some of the security men, some newspaper men, and the, pres the vice president uh, stood up in front of me. His wife stood on his left, and Mrs. Kennedy had sent word in that she wanted to be present. I gave uh, Mr. Johnson the oath of office. He swore to perform the duties of the President of the United States to the best of his ability, to uphold, defend, and preserve the Constitution of the United States, and then ended with, so help me God. The search for the President's assassin centered around the book depository. The shots were fired from a sixth floor window which remained open. An employee named Lee Harvey Oswald had been questioned by police in the building, but the manager told them he works here and he was not detained. On the sixth floor, an Italian-made rifle with a telescopic sight was found. It was later traced to Oswald through an order sent to a mail order firm in Chicago. Police said Oswald's palm print was on the weapon, and tests showed the bullets which killed the president were fired from the rifle. Charles Breen was at the assassination scene with his small son. He describes the horror of the moment. Fortunately, I was probably 15 to 20 feet away from the president when it happened. Tell us exactly what you saw, sir. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he was coming down the street, and my five-year-old boy and myself were by ourselves on the grass there on Palmer Street, and I asked Joe to wave to him, and Joe waved, and I waved, and the man... The man... That's all right, sir. You Go waved. Ahead, as, he, as he was waving back, he, he was... He was the shot rang out and he slumped down in the seat and his wife reached up toward him and he, 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 he was slumping down and the second shot went off and it just knocked him down from, from the seat. The two shots. Two shots. Did you see the man who did the... No, sir, I did not see the man who did it. I, I, all, I, all I did was look in the man's face when he was shot there and saw that expression on his face and grab himself and slide. And the second one, whenever it went, why, I'm positive it hit him. I hope it didn't, but I'm positive that it hit him, and, it, and he went all the way down in the car. Then they speeded up, and I didn't know what was going on, so I just grabbed the boy and fell on him, and I hope so there wasn't a maniac around me. I'm sorry. Uh, I can't help you more, but I, I won't forget. Yes. Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett stopped a man on an Oak Cliff street corner. The suspect shot him down, then ran into a nearby theater where other officers overpowered and arrested him. He was identified as the same Lee Harvey Oswald who was employed at the book depository. Taken to the police station and identified as the man who gunned down Officer Tippett, Oswald immediately became the prime suspect in the assassination of the president. He had once defected to Russia, married a Russian girl, and finally returned to this country. He had been associated with a pro-Castro group in this country and had been living in a cheap room in Oak Cliff, not far from the spot where Officer Tippett was slain. Evidence began to pile up against him, but he denied killing anyone. He admitted Marxist leanings and was described by officers who questioned him as arrogant. Homicide Captain Will Fritz flatly stated, this is the man who killed the president. Meanwhile, Police Officer Bentley describes the arrest of the suspect. He fought with us like a wild man, and <clears throat> we finally subdued him and took him on out, put him in the police car and brought him in to the Homicide Bureau. Who did he aim the gun at? The gun wasn't necessarily aimed. It was started, he started to pull it up to aim it, and Officer McDonald had a hold of, his, of the gun. I had a hold of his right arm. <clears throat> we got a thumb or something in between the hammer and the firing pin to prevent it from actually firing, and it just snapped slightly and kept from going off. It didn't misfire. In other words, you prevented it from firing. Yes, the hand was possibly prevented from firing. But there was a bullet in the chamber. Definitely so, and it had been hit with a firing pin, but not enough to go off. Did he say what was reported about he got in the president? No, sir, I didn't hear that. What did he say to you after he was arrested? He just said, uh, this is it. It's all over with now. The Dallas police station was a madhouse as newsmen converged on the scene of one of the big news stories of the century. 
Oswald appeared from time to time as police transferred him from one room to the other. Mostly silent, he occasionally proclaimed his innocence and once asked for the services of a New York attorney. Arriving at the police station but not permitted to talk to the suspect were his widowed mother from Fort Worth and his Soviet-born wife and their two children. The morning of November 24th, Oswald had been charged with both the murder of the president and of Officer Tippett. NBC's live television cameras were at the city hall as the accused assassin was being transferred to the Dallas County Jail. Millions of TV viewers were stunned when... ...being let out by uh, Captain Fritz. There is the president. There is Lee Oswald. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. There's the man with a gun. It's absolute panic. Absolute panic here in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. The detectives have their guns drawn. Oswald has been shot. There is no question about it. Oswald has been shot. Pandemonium has broken loose here in the uh, basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. Police had admitted newsmen to the city hall, but a Dallas nightclub operator named Jack Ruby had eluded the security precautions and stood among newsmen and detectives as Oswald was led out to a waiting car. He leaped toward the suspected assassin and fired one bullet at point-blank range. It struck Oswald just below the heart. Detectives wrestled Ruby to the floor, then immediately hustled him to jail. Associates of Ruby said he was despondent over the president's death. They said the police buff spent considerable time at the police station and was known by many officers. How he got into the police station this day has never been fully explained. But one thing is certain, his bullet left questions about the president's assassination, which will never be answered. Reaction to the third shooting in less than 48 hours was mixed, ranging from disbelief to a few cheers from the crowd at the county jail awaiting Oswald's arrival. The unconscious Oswald was taken to Parkland Hospital where President Kennedy died and where Governor Connolly still was battling for his life. A Secret Service man stood by in the hope Oswald might make some statement, and doctors used all their skills in an effort to save his life, but it was in vain. He died at 13, 107 our time, 13.07. Oswald's family arrives too late. On Monday, final rites for the president were conducted in Washington and memorial services were held across the nation. At Carswell Air Force Base, tribute was paid the dead president at the spot where he boarded the plane a short time before he died. There were two other funerals that day for persons who figured in the assassination. Officer Tippett was honored at Wright's in Dallas. And Lee Harvey Oswald, who grew up in Fort Worth, a chubby, smiling boy, went to a lonely grave in Rose Hill Cemetery at the eastern edge of Fort Worth. Newsmen were recruited to serve as pallbearers, and a few curious spectators stood by as Oswald was buried with only his close relatives as mourners. As soon as he was able, Governor Connolly appeared on nationwide television to give the most lucid account so far of the tragic events of November 22nd. We had just turned the corner. We heard a shot. I turned to my left. I was sitting in the jump seat. I turned to my left to look in the back seat. The president had slumped. Uh, he had said nothing. Almost simultaneously, as I turned, I was hit. And I knew I'd been hit badly, and uh, I said, I knew the president had been hit, and I said, my God, they're going to kill us all. And then there was a third shot, and the president was hit again, and we, we thought then very seriously. I had still regained consciousness, but the president had, been, had slumped in Miss Kennedy's lap, and when he was hit the second time, she said, or the first time, I, it, it all happened in such a brief span, she said, 
Uh, oh my God, they kill my husband. Jack, Jack. The spot in Dallas where the president was shot quickly became a mecca for visitors. Memorial wreaths dotted the grassy slopes near the fateful spot as officials planned a permanent memorial near the scene.